Hello my friends. So, I know it's been a while since I've made a video. Sorry about that. Um, I started up school again a few weeks ago and it's been taking up a lot of my time and uh, I figured I'd just take a short break while I was transitioning between being off for about a month to being back in school, but I already have sort of a story from class that I wanted to share with you and then some of my thoughts about what happened. And uh, I'm taking a high level philosophy class this year. It's a 425 course, uh, 400 level course, which is I think the highest that they offer. I think they do offer like five and 600 level, but for graduate students. And there are actually a few graduate students in this class and it's taught <coughs> by a a renowned philosopher who actually has her own Wikipedia page and whatnot, and she's, I guess, referenced in the contemporary philosophical community. She has some uh, books and papers that she's published, and she's kind of made a name for herself. And so, um, it's interesting to learn from her, because... Her, the main focus of her career has been Kant and Hegel. And um, in this class, we started out by reading a paper written by Kant called An Idea for a Universal History. Idea for a Universal History from a Cosmopolitan Point of View. And basically the whole thrust of this essay that he wrote is that history has uh, been leading us through the influence of some universal idea, which Kant refers to as nature throughout the uh, throughout the essay he, he says that nature has a plan it has a design it has an end goal a teleological end goal for humanity that it is pushing us toward and that we are developing toward and we were talking about this in class, we were talking about the concept of moral progress and this teleological end of history which Kant believes in. And I rose my hand, raised my hand, and basically said that it's very difficult for me to detach this idea of moral progress and of history and humanity having some kind of grand finale or end goal, final conclusion that we're heading toward. Some great rapture. It's impossible for me, or it's very difficult for me, to separate that from Christianity. And I know that Kant was a, a Christian. He came from a very hardcore Christian family. And so I mentioned that, and the professor basically responded with, well, just try. Can't you just separate moral progress from, from religion, from Christianity? Don't you think that there has been moral progress throughout history? And at the time I responded, no, but I had not much more to say. But now I've done a little bit more research and I think that this idea of moral progress is essentially Christian. And not just Christian, but it has its roots going all the way back to Judaism. I mean, Christianity is nothing more than an iteration of Judaism that's meant for the goyim. So it's, uh, it's something that you cannot understand someone like Kant without taking into account this Judeo-Christian influence. And 
So I did more reading about this. I actually got a book called Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition. And in reading that, Hegel has a very similar idea about history. So it's interesting that this professor I have has focused on Kant and Hegel because they both have very similar ideas about history having some absolute idea or universal idea that God is trying to realize in the world through humanity and that we're supposed to develop and uh, ascend to this end result where moral, moral progress has been achieved and heaven on earth is basically created. And so I have some quotes here which support this idea. Um, so I'll just read them to you and so by the way, wh what is the end goal? That's, that's the question. What is history meant to lead us toward? If there's this great moral progress that's happening, what what is the end that we're looking for? And Kant tells us, he says in his idea for a universal history from a cosmopolitan point of view, he says in the fifth thesis of the essay, quote, the greatest problem for the human race to the solution of which nature drives men is the achievement of a universal civic society which administers law among men. Administers law. What kind of law do you think? Maybe the Torah? I don't know. Uh, so, he's telling us that what these people believe the end of history is, is for all of humanity to be subsumed under one universal state. A perfect state. And these, pe these people are deeply religious about this. They think that they are bringing about God's kingdom on earth and that they're sort of working, they're collaborating with God on this project. Sounds crazy, I know. But the people who are in elite positions have always been deeply religious. I mean, look look back in history, and you'll see the, the rulers thought that, that they themselves were gods. So, and I mean the rulers of empires, typically. In tribal societies, I don't think you had this kind of megalomania going on. But in imperial states, I think it's the norm that you have to have a group of people that sees themselves as higher than everyone else, that has some kind of destiny to conquer the world. <clears throat> so, um, let me give you some quotes of Hegel, well, quotes about Hegel from this book called Hegel and Hermeticism, which is extremely well-researched, well-cited. Um, this guy really goes through and... Uh, gives you an extru a ridiculous amount of sources for this information and he's very detailed in his analysis and he gives these quotes um, Hegel says uh, objective spirit is the absolute idea as embodied in human history culture and social institutions in objective spirit, we seek to approach the absolute through social institutions and practices. So this is what, what is approaching the absolute. Kant saw the universal idea, which is very similar to his idea of the absolute, is this universal civic state, which administers perfect law among men. So this is what they think history is working us up toward. 
Um, a couple pages later in this book, this guy talking about Hegel again says, Thus, we find in the Kabbalah something very much like Hegel's concept of the end of history. The end of the world and of man is realized in time and on earth through the, quote, presence of God coming to be in human institutions, in objective spirit. That's what he means by objective spirit, is these institutions which are actually influencing and causing society to function. So, and again, Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of history can be seen as an attempt to make good on the prediction that the new science would include a theodicy, an attempt to show that history is the public theater of God's ways and of all providence. Hegel is playing the role of world historical alchemist. I know I just threw a lot at you there, but um, what I really want to get across is that this idea of moral progress, this, if you think about the word progressives, I'm going to start going to work. I got to get to work. I read you some quotes, but now I got to get to work. If you think about progressives, which is used as basically a synonym for leftists, leftists subscribe to this progressive thought. What is the origin of this thought? Where does it come from? Where does this whole concept of history originate? And this is what this book Hegel and the Hermetic Tradition is telling us. So, sorry, my tripod actually just broke. <laughs> That's nice. Uh, So when we think of progressives, progressives are, you know, that word is used as a synonym for leftists and their whole mentality. They think that they're progressing towards something. What are they progressing toward? Somebody like Kant is saying they're progressing toward universal world government. And the funny thing about this class, I think, is that the pretension is that this is all uh, secular and uh, non-religious, philosophical, nothing but logical and based on evidence. That's, that's the pretense of this class. When in fact we're working with ideas that have spawned from a deeply religious point of view goes all the way back to Jewish Kabbalism. And to ignore that, to not show that that is where this is coming from, especially if you're a scholar of somebody like Hegel and Kant, like this professor is, for her to tell me, well, why don't you just remove the concept of moral progress from the Judeo-Christian context or the Judeo-Christian essence of it? Why don't you just remove the two, separate them? That is either dishonest or it is completely ignorant and it's unbelievable that somebody who's been studying for decades these two thinkers is not willing to acknowledge that both Hegel and Kant, these people who were promoting this idea of history having a grand finale, some grand end that we're progressing toward, that these people were, you know, influenced by, not just influenced, but they were, they were basically in the tradition of, like, Jewish Kabbalism. And so, thinking of this idea, keeping this idea in mind, this is getting to be a bit of a long video, but I hope you're still with me. When we look at what the elites are doing, because we know 
we know who the elites are. You know, it's they're, they're the the tribe that Jordan Peterson won't <laughs> criticize. I'll put it that way. We start to wonder, you know, what their religion has to do with it, and, and whether their religion is related to their motivations for um, things like uh, this this migrant crisis. When they're causing these grand historical events to occur, like the migrant crisis in Europe, where, I mean, you have this or grand orchestrated event where the Middle East is destabilized by the United States, yeah, by the United States and other countries, NATO allies, destabilize the Middle East, invite all of the migrants, uh, psychologically terrorize the native population into accepting it. This is all planned and orchestrated. This is not something that's accidental. And so once we understand that, and I mean, they already have admitted this. The SPLC in that one video said, you know, that this has been planned. This re demographic replacement has been planned for uh, decades now. And uh, the whole migrant crisis, the whole, whatchamacallit, uh, with Barbara Spector saying that Jews are at the center of this multi, this shifting of Europe into a multicultural mode. These people who give hope to those who still believe that things will get better here. One of them is Barbara Spector, a former American who made Aliyah and then 10 years ago, with the help of the government of Sweden, set up a non-denominational institute of Jewish learning with the Greek name of Paideia here in Stockholm. She believes the current wave of anti-Semitism in Sweden will pass and that Jews have an important role to play in a country undergoing profound change. I think there's a resurgence of anti-Semitism because at this point, in time, Europe has not yet learned how to be multicultural. And I think we're going to be part of the throes of that, of that transformation, which must take place. Europe is not going to be the monolithic uh, uh, societies that they once were in the last century. Jews are going to be at the center of that. It's a huge transformation for Europe to make. They are now going into a multicultural mode, and Jews will be resented because of our leading role. But without that leading role and without that transformation, Europe will not survive. What does their religion have to do with this? Do they have sort of a, a bigger plan in mind? And I'm telling you, yes, their plan is universal civic society, universal rule, where everyone is governed by their perfect law. And in order to accomplish this, if they, if they want control over the globe, they kind of have to get rid of the races that would stand in the way. And the sort of cultures, mentalities, ways of life that would stand in their way. And Europe especially the Northern European, Central European, all of Europe. Their way of life is very localistic. It's very tribalistic, even to this day. I mean, 
I know that the world has very much degenerated, but we are still, to this day, instinctively tribalistic. And for there to be different countries with different interests, different, you know, cultural groups and, and sovereignty over their own territory, they maintain sovereignty over their own territory, that is... You know, uh, a roadblock for this grand world project that they're on. And they are so megalomaniacal. If you really look into Kabbalah and the Kabbalistic beliefs that have influenced people like Hegel and Kant, they're so megalomaniacal that they believe that <laughs> that they have through, through gnosis, through their uh, brilliant intellects and their study of history and their study of nature that they have uncovered God's plan and that God requires them to be a sort of collaborator in the process and that by knowing God's plan and putting it into action you literally become like a God figure that is bringing God into the world you're introducing his be you're, you're sort of manifesting his being in the world by you know having this knowledge and, and applying it so yeah uh, I think that it was a necessary step it's it's sort of a necessary step to eliminate nationalistic sentiment to eliminate those races which have the strongest nationalistic instincts and to, you know, slowly dissolve every nation state and uh, strip them of their sovereignty and have it brought into this world system that they're trying to set up. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, I think, don't really get into what religion really has to do with it. We all know that the people in charge are led by a certain religious element. What does religion have to do with it? Is there a bigger plan here? What's their end goal? Thank you for watching. That's about all I have for today.